Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning. Welcome to 2020 AI BPM Talks. A very war warm welcome to the keynote speaker, to the moderator, the, to the panelists, and all the participants. Thank you for joining. Thank you, ma'am. I am Thank Yolanda you. on behalf of AI BPM. I hope everyone is doing great during this difficult time. It is a great honor for IBPM to have all of you here. So this is our third webinar this month. So let me give you just a little information about AIBPM Talks. AIBPM Talks is a program where AIBPM provides a platform for researchers to present their research results virtually. Usually, we collaborate and invite researchers to attend international conferences in Indonesia. But Due to COVID-19 outbreak, we need to postpone and holding the conference later. However, AIBPM will not stop collaborating with many genius researchers, so we decided to have the AIBPM talks. In this webinar, we will hear a presentation from the keynote speakers, and there will be a question and answer session after the presentation. And there are various topics that will be presented, such as business and management, finance, human research, education, and many other topics. And today, June 26, 2020, our keynote speaker will be Dr. Theo Kokban from Central College Penang, Malaysia. Good morning, Dr. Derek. Good morning, Yola. And the moderator of today's webinar is Professor Uma Warrior from CMS Business School, Jane, deemed to be University India. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. And the panelists today are Associate Professor Dr. Daisy Kim Wei Hung from University Saints Malaysia. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Miss Yolanda, and good morning, everyone. Our second panelist is Irfan Hussein Khan from Government College University Faisalabad, Pakistan. Good morning. Our third panelist is Christine Winston Indah Sandroto from Atmajaya Catholic University of Indonesia. Good morning, Miss Christine. Our fourth panelist. Miss Gan Kiahui from Central College Penang, Malaysia. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Next is Miss Lok Yihui from University Saints, Malaysia. Good morning. Good morning. Our six panelists is Professor Dr. R. K. Singal from Abbas Engineering College, Gaziabad, India. Uh, good morning to everyone. Next is Dr. Rudres Pandey from Abbas Engineering College, Gaziabad, India. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And our last panelist is Dr. Rajesh Kumar Nair from SIES College of Management Studies, India. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And without any further ado, let's get started the presentation. Our moderator today is an academician and psychological counselor with over 25 years of experience in the field of education and IT industry. She is presently a professor in HRM and Industrial Psychology at CMS Business School, Jane, deemed to be University, Bangalore. Also, she holds the post of chief counselor for the Jane group of institutions. Her rich experience spans across multiple areas in the value chain, teaching, research, counseling, training, and consulting. And right now, I would like the moderator to take over the session. Professor Uma Werrier, please be my guest. Thank you. Thank you, uh, ABPM coordinator. Namaste. Uh, very good morning to all of you. I'm Dr. Uma Warrior, professor from CMS B School. Jain University, Bangalore, India. I will be moderating today's webinar on psychosocial safety climate in education industry. A very warm welcome to all of you present here. Uh, now, this webinar is expected to last for an hour and a half. 
In this time, we would hear the opinions and point of views of our keynote speaker for the first 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer session by the panelists for the next 40 minutes, and then the floor would be open for questions from the attendees for the last 20 minutes. That's the flow of the event. I'm taking the liberty to set the ground rules for the webinar before we start the proceedings for the day. The rules are, all panelists and participants will be muted during the presentation by the keynote speaker. There will be a question and answer session after the keynote speaker finishes his presentation. Participants may ask questions or suggestions to the keynote speaker in the chat box provided. Moderator will note down the questions and ask them to the keynote speaker later. The moderator has the authority to choose who will deliver the question or a suggestion. All participants, panelists, moderator and keynote speaker will get an e-certificate that will be distributed within maximum of seven days after the webinar. If you do not receive the certificate within seven days, please send an inquiry mail to aibpm.conference at gmail.com. Participants will be asked to switch on their video towards the end of the webinar to capture a group photograph. Now let's talk about today's webinar theme. In the last few months, the COVID-19 pandemic has toppled the balance of our daily life. History has been uh, seeing many such uh, business upheavals due to natural and human-made disturbances in the ecosystem and thereby the business cycle challenges. But this kind of pandemic which we are seeing now is unprecedented and this pandemic connect, uh, connected changes may be long-lasting, unlike the previous uh, pandemics because of the disruption of uh, the way we communicate to each other. We have left with no choice but to embrace technology for communication and virtual communication has become the order of the day. The effect of this pandemic can affect the psychosocial well-being of working professionals. Thereby, a thorough research of psychosocial climate is warranted. Now, just for our understanding, psychosocial climate is a specific aspect of organization climate defined as policies, practices and procedures for workers' uh, psychosocial health and safety. Psychosocial climate is largely determined by the management and the leadership within the organization. So we are gathered today to specifically explore the impact of the psychosocial safety climate on the education industry. We are fortunate to have keynote speakers and panelists from Malaysia, India, Indonesia and Pakistan that will push our learning horizon. With that, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. With great pleasure, I introduce you to Dr. Uh, Tio Kok Ban, also known as Derek. We will call him Dr. Derek, who is a lecturer from School of Education and General Studies, Central College, Penang, Malaysia. He's obtained his first degree in applied statistics, then a master's degree in statistics, uh, and a PhD in organizational behavior and development from University Saints, Malaysia. He has 11 years of teaching experience in higher learning institutions. Throughout his career so far, he used to teach courses such as mathematics, statistics, and business research methods. His area of interest are in statistics and organizational behavior uh, and development. In addition, his current program of research focuses on psychosocial safety, climate, and well-being, which is the need of the hour. So Dr. Derek brings to the table an exciting combination of quantitative expertise and organizational behavior competence. I'm sure that all of us are eager to hear his valuable insights on the topic today. So over to you, Dr. Derek. You may start your presentation now. All the best. Uh, all right. Thank you, uh, Professor Uma. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, I am Dr. Derek from Central College, Penang, Malaysia. So today is my honor to share with you uh, my topic, which title Psychosocial Safety Climate in Education Industry. In Education Industry. All right. So I would like to share my content. All right. Can you all see my slide? Yeah. Yes, sir, it is visible. Yeah, thank you. All right. So, uh, my topic today is psychosocial safety climate in education industry. So, I for this year, uh, year of 2020, it is actually quite common, or we will say familiar with COVID-19 because it uh, happened across the globe. So, particularly in Malaysia, uh, coronavirus is actually an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered coronavirus. So, to World Health Organization, or WHO has declared 
uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 as an academic status uh, at 11 March of 2020. So in order to curb the crisis of COVID-19 in Malaysia, the Malaysia's government has declared a movement control order, or we name it as MCO in Malaysia, starting from 18 March 2020 until 3 March of 2020. So this MCO, or we name it as movement control order, is not really a lockdown of the country. It is more on a movement restriction. However, the eligible services are still available all right, in, a, in the country. So in view of the ec economy development of certain sector, starting from 4th May 2020 up to 9th June 2020, the government has revised MCO into CMCO, or we name it as Conditional Movement Control Order, in order to ensure the survival of certain economy sector. And in view with the improvement of COVID-19 situations in Malaysia, then the government once again revised CMCO into RMCO, or we name it as Recovery Movement Control Order, which actually started from 10 June 2020 up to 31st August 2020. That is to say, we Malaysian at this time being is actually under the stage of Recovering Movement Control Order. So thanks to the frontliner as well as the entire Malaysians who give their best to curb this issue. However, we as an educator, of course, we are greatly impacted by the effects of COVID-19. So uh, what happened, especially in Malaysian education due to COVID-19? So but basically, all education industry, uh, industry or institution in Malaysia are forced to shut down since the start of MCO, which means 18 March of 2020. So and this, actually, uh, this shutdown is actually quite sudden. And these changes are not really in, in our hand or we are prepared for that. So in order to ensure the continuous of delivery as well as the assessments of the students, so the Malaysia educators are actually striving their best to actually bring the physical classroom delivery into online platform delivery. So since we do not have much option in order to go for delivery, so Mal Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia has instructed particularly all learn higher learning institution to continue implementing online teaching until the end of 2020. This is, uh, this is because uh, the government is worried that we have second wave of coronavirus infection. Therefore, if we are possible, we will do it in online learning institution that to go with the uh, online platform. And that's to say that our educators workload increases. And why we say that it increases? Because previously, educators workload before COVID-19 their job demand are actually very complicated or complex. And with COVID-19 impact, it is even more workload to come in. So what are the main workload before COVID-19? As we can see, the main workload, or we call it as job demand, the Malaysian educator, or I believe across the globe, we are actually uh, in charge of teaching. All right, so teaching is not only to teach during the classroom, but the preparation usually takes time. And then, uh, other than that, we have a lot of paperwork, be it kindergarten, primary school, or high school, or even uh, tertiary education. We have a lot of paperwork to deal with. And other than that, the consultation. The consultation itself is not only aimed to the students, but also to the parents or anyone who need the, uh, their address, uh, their consent to be addressed. So the consultations over here is including the counselling part that an educator should do. So whenever the students, they face some challenges or difficulty or anything that they need help to, or they need understanding that uh, Malaysian educators, or I believe all educators, we should play our role to understand and to accompany and to help them. And that is a part of the job of the educators. And other than that, especially for higher learning institution, they have to do their research in order to commercialize their research finding so as to bring it into practical, that is to help to solve the, the problem which exists uh, globally or even locally, then this research actually takes time and is actually creating the workload, or I would say the stress among the academician. And other than that, it is quite common that the publication has been listed as one of the promotion criteria among the academician. And a uh, publication itself is not only count on the number, but also count on the quality. So the uh, as an academic, 
local, uh, local or private university or even colleges, they should publish their finding, their research into Impactful Journal Bank. And knowing that Impactful Journal Bank, they have a very high requirement in terms of significance and also in terms of contribution. And all these are all actually existing workloads of Malaysian educator. There are more yet to be listed here. So this is why we say that Malaysian educators, or I believe all educators across the globe, we are actually experiencing high job demand. But unfortunately, in the year of 2020 this year, we are actually impacted by the effects of COVID-19 and we need to go for online platform adaptation. Like what I said earlier, MCO uh, start on 18 March and the entire nation was informed on 16 March by the Prime Minister. So we have actually two days to get ready and prepare to move everything, especially delivery consultation into online platform. So uh, like I myself, I'm not ready for the change, but I have to go with the changes. So all the educators, they have to identify the online platform tools, then they have to learn, they have to explore, they have to adapt, or I would say they have to be skillful enough in order to deliver the effective lesson, as well as to guide the students to be engaged during the lesson. So with that, online platform adaptation has increased the job demand significantly. So with that, uh, job demand can lead Malaysian educator, or I would say all educator, to experience burnout. And it is actually further supported by a theory named Conservation of Resources Theory. It is said by Hopeful that an individual will be stressful when there is a possible loss of resources or total loss of resources, or they can't gain back whatever resources that, that are lost. And with this condition persists, the individual tends to experience strain. And it is the work by Hopeful as well as Westman and a colleague at year 2005. So let me put it in a way, an individual tends to experience burnout if there is a possible loss of resources of theirs, or total loss, or whatever they have lost, they can't gain back again. So uh, bringing it, this COR theory into the context of today's discussion, it can be understood as high job demand will lead to low job resources. Why? Because we need the resources to cope with the job demand. And with that, Malaysian educator will fight very hard to reserve resources, whatever resources they still have, have on hand in order to deal with the remaining job demand or the concurrent job demand. And with these situations, the Malaysian educators or all educators are actually experiencing loss spiral. So basically, the high job demand is already happening before the COVID-19. And with COVID-19, it is even high, higher of job demand. And of course, the higher the job demand, the lower the job resources because it has been used up. So the Malaysian educator or all educator, they will fight very hard to reserve resources. So while it is losing and they are still fighting to reserve the resources and they are actually experiencing loss period. So it is supported by COR theory. So this is also actually mentioned by Hopeful at year 2001. So based on not only actually supported by the COR theory, it is also found by the past significant study that an English individual tends to experience burnout when it is high job demand and there is a low job of resources. And I would say job demand and job resources, they happen at the same time where high job demand require a lot of job resources to handle with. So with higher job demand, that will lead to a lower of job resources and the individual tends to burn out. And it was found 19 years ago by Demorati and the colleagues. So as we can see, the problems that I have been uh, discussing right now is actually supported by COR theory as well as by the previous significant study that Malaysian educators are experiencing high job demand or I will say higher, more, even higher job demand due to COVID-19 and then lead to the burnout. And it is supported by COR theory as well as the previous significant studies. So, uh, First of all, what do we understand of burnout okay, in this context or in today's discussion? So burnout has been actually defined by Maslach and the colleague at year 1996 as a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishment. 
So all we can understand in an easier way is that burnt out is a state of long suffering and we are out of energy if we are burnt out and we are exhausted as well as feeling low enthusiasm to the things that we like all the way. Then like what I mentioned earlier, burnt out is actually caused by high job demand. So in this uh, context of today's discussion, job demand is actually advised to be separated into challenge demand as well as hidden demands by Kavanaugh at year 2000. So challenge demand is actually referring to rewarding work experience that create personal growth. However, on the other hand, hidden demand is the obstacle, or I would say barrier to personal growth that interfere with one ability to achieve their value goals. So job demand should be separated because we can, we can perceive challenge demand as a positive demand, whereas hidden demand as a negative demand. So positive and negative demand features of the job demand, of course, they will lead to different outcome of the work performance among employee or in our context as Malay, uh, Malaysian educators. So with that, it is again, uh, let's look through uh, COR theory to say that when a person is failed to cope with job, higher job demand, or when the job demand is high, especially in COVID-19, then there will be, uh, there will be have a tendency of reductions of resources. And the reductions of resources will lead to stress or emotional exhaustion by helpful in the year of 1989. And in the later year of 2002, Hoffman mentioned that we should focus on other resources. If the existing resources are no longer helpful, then we should focus on other resources which to serve as stress counteractions are more real. So this is perfectly matching with the current situations where we have a new job demand on higher workload, we should focus on other resources so that the stress among Malaysian educator or even educator across the globe their burnout level, their stress level can be addressed and decreased to the minimum level. So in today's discussion, the other resources that I would like to focus is actually PSC, or we name it as Psychosocial Safety Climate. Then first of all, what do we understand about PSC? It's actually a shared perceptions among employees regarding the policy, the practices, or the procedure in the workplace. Why? Because it is related to worker psychological health and well-being, or we name it as like a standard operation procedure in an insti uh, education institution, be it kindergarten or primary school, even high school, or even private colleges, university or local university. Or we can understand it in an easier way. The essay is actually a leading indicator for a better working environment. How does the better working environment is cultivated? It can be done through manageable job demand, or I will say feasible job demand that it is achievable and something that can bring the education industry to a next higher level. So with that, if we have the essay, it is believed that the essay is able to reduce the negative implication of job demand. But in this context, I would like to differentiate job demand into challenge demand and hindrance demand. While challenge demand and hindrance demand are in the right position, it is able to reduce the burnout level among all educators. So based on the past study from the literature, it, will, it is found that PSC is uh, having a significant positive relationship between uh, for PSC on challenge demand. So recalling challenge demand act as a rewarding experience, or I would say positive job demand. So PSC is able to actually promote for the higher level of challenge demand. And it was found by Idris at year of uh, 2015. On the other hand, PSC, which acts as an indicator, it is able to reduce the negative implications of hindrance demand. So let's recall hindrance demand is actually an obstacle or barrier or something negative job demand. So PSC is able to reduce the negative impact of hindrance demand. So therefore, with a good challenge demand uh, to be increased and with the bad hindrance demand to be reduced, the burnout level among educators can be decreased. And it is also found by Abbas and Raja last year, it is having the significant relationship with burnout. Meanwhile, PSC itself also was found to have a positive significant, uh, sorry, negative significant direct relationship from PSC to burnout. That is to say, the higher the PSC in a learning institution, the lower the burnout among the educators. So as we can see over here, 
challenge demand and hindrance demand, they do process certain impact of burnout. All right. So, however, it was found uh, six years ago by Yulita uh, that hindrance demand they actually projected stronger effect on burnout. So that is to say, PSC when it is able to reduce the level of hindrance demand, therefore. Indirectly or directly, the burnout level also will be reduced significantly. Although challenge demand also a contributor to burnout, but it was found by Yulita that the effects on burnout is not really uh, observable or it's not really obvious. So with PSE increase the challenge demand, where it will actually increase the work engagement among uh, educator, then the effect on the burnout is can can be said negligible. Therefore. Uh, our focus is here, the hindrance demand after being sorted out and it has been reduced by BSC, then it will reduce the level of burnout. So in conclusion, it can be said that higher psychosocial safety climate or we say BSC, it is able to increase the challenge demand among educators as well as to lower down the hindrance demand among educators. And therefore, the burnout among educators can be uh, lower down or reduced. So to recap the entire discussion, we start with job demand. Job demand is all the time, or I would say all time, higher uh, workload among educators across the globe. And because with the COVID-19, the job demand is even higher, or I would say overwhelming. And the job demand supported by COR theory or by the previous significant study, is said that it will lead to burnout among Malaysian educators or all the educators. And based on the suggestion by Hopeful at year 2002, other resources should be focused. And these other resources in this context to these discussions, I would like to focus on PSC, uh, which serves as a stress counteraction memory. So with higher PSC, it is able to reduce the negative impact job demand, as well as eventually reducing the lower level of uh, job burnout among educators. So with that, with the minimum level of burnout, then we should observe quality teaching among the educator as well as their job commitment or their work engagement among uh, the educators. And also, what we have found indirectly, job demand can serve as a mediator. So job demand serve as mediator is a common thing in the literature. However, my context is to suggest job demand should be separated into challenge demand and hindrance demand to serve as the mediator. It is something uh, still new and fresh that can be done in order to understand the mediation effects. So the implication of today's uh, discussions is that it can be divided into theoretical as well as practical. So in terms of theoretical, it is actually contributing a lot in educational context. And based on my research, in terms of education in Malaysia, that is actually yet uh, there are quite a lot of institutions or I would say uh, even higher learning institutions, they are yet to apply PSC or they actually don't really look into the aspect of the PSC yet. So if we can apply PSC into the setting in all education level, then it will be very helpful in terms of uh, work performance as well as their job and out. Other than that, uh, it is contributing in terms of differentiated into job demand. Uh, it is actually proven true in the literature that there are certain job demand which are very motivating, as well as there are certain job demand which is actually uh, bring down the performance of the employee. So if we can sort it up the job demand into challenge demand and hindrance demand, then we would like to promote the level of challenge demand. So as to promote for the personal growth among the educator, as well as to lower down the hindrance demand so that they are not exposed to something that demotivate them. And also, it is found in the study that new mediator can be done, where PSC can project its impact on the working environment or we say the job demand. And based on the challenge demand and hindrance demand, which in the right position, they will project the lower impact uh, on the burnout level to be lowered down. So with new mediator, we can understand better how PSC is helpful to burnout. Meanwhile, for practical, it is helpful in terms of change of management practices. So if the management in terms of uh, all education level, be it kindergarten, like one mentioned earlier, primary school, or even high school, or even higher learning institutions, if they can look into the 
indicator of PSE, then the management practices can quickly change. And then there we will see the benefit of PSE is translated into practice. Second, we are more to focus on working condition if we focus on PSC in terms of management. Why? Because it is actually uh, looking to, to improve the working condition as well as their job demand among educators. And also, relevant and suitable KPI can be plotted or can be established based on the suggestion or based on the indicator of PSC. So in future, uh, research or future directions that can be uh, that can gain or that can be benefited from today's discussion is that we can actually have focused research. Okay, focused research in terms of the uh, specialized research on different education level. So we understand that different education level among the Malaysian educators they have different requirement, different KPI. They also have different job demands. So if we can do focused research, then we can better address different type of problem or different level of burnout among the educators. And also, it is suggested to combine PSC with other climates that we used to know. For example, we can combine PSC with safety climate because PSC is more concerning about psychological, psychological health, whereas safety climate is more, is more caring on the safety side of the employee. So if we can do combination or I would say integration, that will be a hybrid structure among PSC with other climate. Other than that, we can also build a more robust PSC. So the existing PSCs that we have now currently, they do not consider the external factors such as economical, technological, demographic, or even social forces. Therefore, PSC might not be so strong, or it can be influenced easily if there are the external factors which actually bring in the interruption. So if we can build a new PSC with the external factors, Therefore, PSC can play its role even effectively. And last but not least, uh, it is advised to identify the antecedent of PSC. So based on the uh, current or contemporary research, uh, it is found that PSC serves as an independent variable, which brings the impact on the mediator as well as the dependent variables. So uh, that is yet to, uh, I mean, there are yet to be found out in a current study, is there any antecedent before PSC? So if we can work on it, maybe we have a better understanding or overall picture how to actually make PRC to be fully utilized in terms of the pictures of uh, management or even in uh, other manufacturing industry or even services industry. So if we can identify the antecedent of PRC, then we can actually manipulate PRC well and therefore we can see the significant effect especially on burnout or work performance. With that, that's, the, that's all for my presentation today. Thank you. Psychosocial safety climate in the education industry. You gave such a beautiful narration on how the new normal practices are for the stakeholders with an accent on academicians. And I especially liked when you said enlarging the PAC dimension with external uh, factors like economic uh, demographic. I think that is you are actually mm, moving away from the uh, the, uh, the, act, the true definition of psychosocial climate, which is well within the organization. I think that's a wonderful idea where you will also because see, I, I do not believe personally that a, uh, an organization work in silo or a person can work in silo. You are impacted by a lot of environmental factors. I think uh, that definitely is a key takeaway for me uh, from your keynote speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now it's time for our panelists to ask questions to the keynote speaker. Uh, may I start uh, the series of questions, uh, the discussion from the panel discussion members? Uh, with uh, to uh, I would want to initiate the discussion with the uh, panel discussion member by inviting Dr. Singhal to start a series of questions to the keynote speaker. Dr. Singhal uh, is the uh, head of the you. Department of Business Administration in the Institute of in India. He's an HI area domain specialist with a long standing experience of 22 years. Dr. Singhal, you must be aware of the challenges posed by the sudden adaptation of technology due to the pandemic. So, you may want to share your perspective and ask a few questions to the keynote speaker. Over to you, Dr. Singhal. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you to Mr. Uh, Derek. Such a yeah, wonderful thank presentation. You. Thank you. And you. Singhal. 
you really uh, touched upon all the valuable points thank you and you really make us understand what the meaning of demand and resources and what is the relation between these two thank you very thank much you. thank you uh, as far as i am concerned uh, i like to add only the one point because most of the point being covered by the uh, mr derek all right uh, i have gone through the presentation of mr Bar uh, dr derek all right i could see one important aspect okay uh, that is you know strike a balance between the challenge demand and the uh, you know uh, the other part the hindrance demand ha huh, hindrance demand what i see uh, the, there is a great role being played by the top management senior management what i experiencing last 3 months you rightly said there is a lot of workload is being increased for the faculty members for our educate uh, for our you know me as a educator we have many other responsibility yeah. we have a family responsibility at the same time if i talk about the Correct. basically my female colleagues they are highly uh, uh, under stress now yes yeah. we are talking about the uh, the whole talk is basically an, in the context of or, or organi organizational perspective but i believe mm. the motivations comes from within even if Hmm. your organizational factors are okay and it is acceptable but still there in some some instances your personal factors plays a vital role okay correct now hmm. i'm keeping apart from uh, i'm i'm i'm, uh, I'm uh, keeping apart from this uh, this uh, personal factor at a side i believe in today's scenario since hmm. the new normal uh, evo is evolving whether our top management we as a professional working as a senior position mm. are we adapted to this new or normal have we accepted are we yeah. really helping our uh, team members to accept this new, new normal so that is my perspective which i really uh, wish you as a uh, you know expert must organize some kind of a small small training programs or some kind of a small session for the senior people working in the education industry so that they can understand yes. this particular perspective and they can be great motivator facilitator all right to create a positive enforcement uh, among the people okay sure. now with uh, i'll go with my question my question uh -huh. was how can we educators strike a balance between the challenge demand the challenge demand basically our aspirations yeah our goals mm -hmm. and i i mentioned stress because since i have a see, uh, i have a higher level goals yeah. after this challenge <laughs> demand but sure. at the same time under i am under stress why i am under mm -hmm. stress because the social factors yes the support for my colleagues the support for my top management was senior was senior management i i refer as a family mm. whether i'm getting or not and how i strike a balance between these two yeah. that is my question because okay. you you know a lot of bullying is effect is there in the uh, practically in the organization when there is a lot of bullying now how okay. i create a balance between these two however i am really inspired uh, for uh, for uh, achieving the my challenge demand yeah that is my question Okay. Uh thank you for the wonderful question from Dr. Singha and also uh your perspective uh, is really enlightening. And then uh based on the question that uh being asked by Dr. Singha that how we actually can strike a balance between the challenge demand as well as the social factor to remain happy especially in the family. So uh because I myself also uh I mean as an educator So I think the first thing that we can have is work life balance. Like what we have, I mean for our work if we it is possible, I know it's not really possible. I mean if we can we can try to schedule our work during the work time and we do not bring back our work into uh I mean into our our non uh working time. So we should spend our time for ourselves personally as well as for the family. And also by doing that we should prioritize our time. 
because uh, right, we might we might forget because too many things we might not know which is more important or which is uh is urgent. So sometimes we forget about the important task, then it tends to be urgent later on because we have limited time to finish it. And other than that, I think we should have allocated personal time, personal time for our own self, where we need some time, you know, some time to have time to like uh to relax or to meditate, or even to to reflect on what happened to us recently. And also we should set the working hour. If let's say we are forced actually take back our work or else we can't finish it on time we should set the certain working hour then after the working hour that's it it should be our own time whatever we want to do so long we are happy about that then we just go for it other than that i think the this point is very important obtaining resources from the uh, i would say from the school or from the uh, any education institution is very important if let's say it is beyond our scope or let's say it is beyond our capability. It is okay to speak out to the management level that what kind of help or resources or assistance is actually being expected. So uh, communication, uh, two-way communication, uh, as well as uh, different, uh, I, I would say, uh, expectation from myself or maybe from the management of the education institution should be communicated so that we understand what they expect and they do understand what challenges we are actually facing. So with that, if you have a work-life balance and you prioritize your time while well, you're having your own time and also you can set your work own working hour even if it's after the working working time and you can actually obtain resources uh, from the management, I think we can we can uh, try our best to stay motivated in job and happy life, I mean, in our own personal life, especially during this challenging COVID-19 pandemic time. That's my suggestion, Dr. Singha. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singha. Thank you, Dr. Derek. And uh, thank you, Dr. Singha. Uh, it was such a pertinent perspective sharing, especially um, I like the point where you said we would like to invite uh, or we should consider inviting Derek to conduct a session for the policymakers so that it will make a difference to the uh, daily life of uh, an academician. I think that was really wonderful sharing and I can see many of the participants in the chat box also sharing something very similar on you know sharing my sentiments so thank you so much for that thank you now I would like to invite Dr. Desi to ask questions to Dr. Derek Dr. Desi is an associate professor at the School of Management University Saints Malaysia she's another domain expert of OB and HR with current research interest on leadership and psychosocial safety climate I invite Dr. Desi to share her perspective and ask a few questions to Dr. Thank you, Professor Uma, for your introductions. And um, to Dr. Derry, well done. I enjoy your presentations. Uh, it is very interesting and wonderful. And uh, I do agree with you that PSC is actually important. And you have actually highlighted uh, how PSC can help to reduce the burnout. I think that is very important for academicians. I do agree with you that the job demands are high and overwhelming for most of the academicians especially i mean regardless you mentioned about the uh, kindergarten or even you know to the primary school secondary or even to the UC level Correct. Uh, but now also has an uh, adverse impact on the employees uh, physical as well as the psychological health so i believe psc is uh, important and it's also one of the indicator to show uh, the parity set by the organizations how well they are actually taking, uh, taking care of the employees in the organization in terms of their psychological health and safety um so my i also like the slides that you talk about the you know how you link uh, your model with the theory cor and you have actually presented us the uh, implications, very and practical. So I would like to ask your opinions, uh, Dr. Eric, yeah. uh, that okay. uh, um, what are your practical advice for university management, particularly for the research university in Malaysia uh, regarding PSC? What are the practical ways that we can 
uh, C from UC, or maybe you can you want to advise to our UC management what are the practical ways to actually to enhance the PSC in the UC. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Daisy. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, insightful feedback, as well as uh, the wonderful question. Uh, so I let me repeat your question again. So what is my advice for the university management, particularly our research university, in how to improve the BRC? So uh, first of all, uh, based on my research, I, I realized that, especially in Malaysia, a research university, the implications of BRC is, uh, I would say, negligible or is kind of low level at the moment. So if let's say if we were, if we were to install BSc into the setting of Malaysian Research University, we shall actually conduct regular measure of BSc to understand the current risk, le uh, risk level among research university. So the regular measure it can be done like uh, monthly. So to identify how uh, how is the performance of BSc in the uh, research university, then with that if they are in a high risk or they are in an average risk, we should evaluate the effectiveness of any intervention. So maybe we can think of any way to address the stress level or whatever uh, work performance, then we can try to evaluate the effectiveness uh, based on the indications of BSc. Then health and safety pr uh, practitioner, they should use BSc, the, uh, I would say research instrument, then which is actually found out by Hall at year 2010, to actually to identify the risk level of a particular institution. However, before, prior with the measurements of the PSC with the 12 item, we should receive training uh, to, uh, in terms of how to implement the PSC as well as how they interpret the PSC then to measure the PSC. So if the PSC score are low, then the interventions uh, need to be done holistically so that change is necessary. So in order to improve BSc in short in RU, then they should actually uh, conduct regular measure. Then they have to evaluate if uh, the risk level is high, then they should evaluate the effectiveness of the, of the current intervention. And then other than that, who should do that? The health and safety practitioner should, should be doing that. Then, but before doing that, they should receive proper training, how to implement and how to interpret. So uh, when to do the changes when the PSC score is low? then the intervention should be done holistically. That's my suggestion, Dr. Daisy. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Daisy. Your prior knowledge on the current theme was visible in your interaction. Mm -hmm. So now let's listen to a different domain expert uh, from health economics, Mr. Irfan Hussein Khan from Pakistan. He's currently pursuing his PhD in economics uh, from Government College University of Faisalabad. His expertise are health economics and public health and development. Over to you, Mr. Khan. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, thank you, PID, for such a great environment and such a very wonderful uh, presentation um, by Dr. Derek. Uh, for thank you. Such a, uh, for such a panic condition prevailing uh, all over the world. Uh, my question is that uh, how we can measure a uh, second social safety climate in education industry? Uh, because in education industry, you know, uh, there's a different level of education sector, uh, like uh, primary and uh, high, and then uh, move toward the uh, poly level, then at the end, upper level uh, toward the university level. Uh, there is a different uh, domain in education society. And then how we can interpret that social, uh, psychosocial safety climate that is a food food for all of the domain. Uh, it's a very uh, typical uh, social psychological thing because it's very from uh, person to person and very from a country to country and region. Uh, it's very uh, uh, for mindset. So, mm. can we elaborate uh, that is uh, social psychological climate is very fruitful for the primary and high sector, for a college level, for a university level, for all, for all. Uh, 
Uh, what do you suggest, uh, early? Uh, uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Efran. Uh, may I uh, repeat your question again? Are you are you asking me how we actually measure PRC in uh, different types of education industry? Yeah, I am asking yeah. you know that how we how we get interpreted that social psychological uh, what level of education it is very good for at a primary level at, at a high at a poly level or a university level. Um, so there is a different level of education yeah, in every country. Yeah. So uh, PRC, because it's a organization climate, even it is from different education industry, it is actually applicable. Because it is not only being proven that uh, only applicable to different type of education level, it has been also proven in the uh, current literature that it can be used in uh, other type of industry as well. So basically, uh, it can be seen widely used in Australia. Then uh, I newly moved to Malaysia, I think uh, 10 years ago. And then uh, now we start to apply PRC into the organizational setting. So uh, it is believed that PRC can be uh, applied into uh, even kindergarten management, even primary school, secondary school, as well as university level. So uh, PRC, uh, we can use PSC to measure the risk level, uh, different type of education level. So based on Hall and a colleague at year 2010, they developed a PSC skill with 12 items in it. And this 12 item actually representing four dimensions, where it talks about management commitment, management priority, organizational communication, as well as organizational participation. So basically, these four dimensions are applicable, or I would say is something similar even throughout the different type of education level. So as long as we are able to assess the commitment from the management, the priority of the management, as well as the communication level exists in the organization, and also the participation among all level of the organization, then we are able to, to see uh, how is the risk level among educators in different type of education level. So uh, if you would like to know more, so PRC is actually a measure from one to five Likert skill, where one stands for strongly disagree and five strongly agree. And uh, PRC with score more than 41, or uh, 41 and above is considered low risk. So if we can use the 12 item, and we do survey on the different type of education level, if you are able to identify 41 uh, score or above, then it is considered low risk. That means they are still okay or they are doing great. But for PSC score, if they score 37 and lower than 40, uh, 41, that means between 37 to lower 41, they are actually at a moderate risk. So we should look into the problem and we should come out with intervention. And also if we have PSC score less than 37, it is recommended by the uh, by by the person who developed this, the hall at year 2010, said that it is actually in high risk. Then we should look into it because this is going to influence the entire organization productivity as well as the effectiveness in terms of delivery or the services provided to the customers. So I would say that PRC, the 12 items that developed by hall at year 2010, can be used in different type of education level so long we can assess and we can do survey and we may able to maybe able to find out the score so i repeat again more than 41 are considered low risk 37 and between 41 consider moderate risk and less than 37 are considered high risk so high risk that means the management itself or i would say the entire level horizontal management we should sit down together and we uh, need to open up to the uh, we will say the comment or feedback so as to find out a new or effective intervention to curb the stress level or I will say the bad performance variable. Yeah, that's my suggestion, Mr. Irfan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gorton. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Professor Uma, I think you didn't unmute your mic. All right. Madam, your voice is not Are you able to hear me now? Yeah. yeah now, now it is okay. Now it is okay. Now it is okay? Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes, yes. 
All right. So thank you, Mr. Khan, for your question. We'll move on to uh, another uh, professor of marketing domain, Dr. Rudresh Pandey. Dr. Rudresh Pandey is a professor in ABS Engineering College, Ghaziabad. Uh, Dr. Rudresh has over 16 years of experience in corporate management education and entrepreneurship. He's an expert in marketing management and digital marketing. Dr. Pandey is actively engaged in research in the field of personality and related constructs apart from his domain expertise, which is a wonderful combination. So um, we would like to hear from you, sir, a different angle to psychosocial safety climate. So please share your perspective and ask a question to Dr. Derek. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uma. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to Dr. Derek for such a wonderful presentation and uh, bringing this aspect of education. And I would also like to congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Singhal and Dr. Uma for suggesting this, that this should be the part of uh, uh, a training maybe with the higher uh, management and I think we'll start with our college. We'd like to start with our college. Uh, so uh, Dr. Derek, uh, 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 be ready. We, we are going to invite you sometime <laughs> for, a training, for a training program. Uh, Dr. Derek, my uh, discussion here is that uh, we, you obviously have spoken about stress and uh, the emotional exhaustion which yeah. is faced uh, in the teaching. So mm -hmm. my question is that how to keep a positive mindset and how to keep, uh, how to take this to the level of happiness for teachers so that they are not yeah. uh, just uh, in the stress level, but they are also happy. They are happy in their profession. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Radish, and thank you for the suggestion. And that's a very good question. So uh, like uh, what I discussed earlier, so uh, in terms of, uh, especially in terms of job demand due to COVID-19, we should actually work out the uh, priorities, like what we, should, uh, what we should do at the moment. Like for example, I, uh, let me share about my own experience. So when I, when I was told to actually go online, actually I have no idea at all because I never do any deliver or teaching through online platform, not even, not even the tools that we are going to use. And from there, we have to think positively, all right? And we don't react to imagine insults, like for example, uh, will, would I do very bad or not? Or like, we keep imagine, uh, this is worse. Uh, this is actually not good. And this is actually making me uh, more burnt out or more stressed. So with the mindset that we have, we should think positively. But how to, uh, how to train ourselves to think positively? Well, we can do it is that we can actually manage our job demand where we can work out the priority. And we also can identify uh, whatever stress situations that we are facing and we can address it uh, appropriately. Like how we are actually going to uh, uh, solve the issues one by one. So talking about like my, uh, my how to say, my situation. At first, when we do live teaching, I said we can do like even like now, we back, or even we do from Zoom, or even we can do from any other platform. Sometimes the students are not engaged, or sometimes the students cannot understand, or sometimes we doubt on ourselves whether we do a great delivery or not. The course is really disadvantaged compared to physical classroom teaching. So, but all this sometimes that, that we are worried is kind of actually pulling us down. So for me, we should do something into practical where I directly ask the feedback from the students and they give various response where some say good, and some say they are they don't really into it because they totally uh, can't uh, understand because of the poor internet connections and uh, they also get some disturbance from the family. They need their own time instead of the fixed schedule time that we provide them. So uh, like what they have suggested to me is that they will say, uh, sir, if you can do pre-record the, uh, pre the video, it will be great because they can uh, restudy again and they can study at your own time and with the good connect, uh, connectivity of, uh, uh, of the internet, as well as it's not, uh, they can find a time where it is not disturbed by the family member, then they can learn it effectively. So from there, based on the feedback, then I try to work in that way, and I find that I'm not so stressful because there is no negative emotion that bothers me. Uh, at the same time, I know that I'm doing something which I can uh, bring my deliver to be more effective, where the students are more happy and satisfied with the delivery. And here I reach my goal and I, uh, I reach my target. So with that, 
the, uh, set, setting the priority as well as I gain the feedback to adjust the stress situation, then I could think positively, I could be very relaxful and I'm not tied to the imagined insults. So with that, I will be keeping myself positively and I, ha I can keep myself with the happy mindset. Yeah, that's all. I hope I address your question. Dr. Rudesh. Sir, sir, to thank you. Thank you very much. It was very thank nice. You. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Rudesh, for that insightful question. And you actually made Dr. Derek talk a lot today. <laughs> uh, we, we will move to the next panelist. We'll hear from someone who is from a finance domain expert, or who's a finance domain expert, Ms. Lo Ki Hui, who has a good number of years of teaching experience in higher learning, uh, higher learning institutions. She's furthering her PhD in financial reporting in University Saints Malaysia. Over to you, Ms. Lok. Uh, thank you to Professor Uma and Dr. Kari for this great sharing. Uh, my question to Dr. Kari is, uh, what is classified under disorders? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lok. And uh, 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 let me repeat your question again. So you are, uh, you are asking me that what are the element under the job resources, is that? Yes. 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 Uh, okay. So, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Locke, for the question. So, based on Karasek at year 1979 and also Damarati with the colleagues at year 2001, they define uh, the job resources which the, uh, with the element such as feedback. So, uh, if the company, or I would say uh, in terms of our today's discussion, is a learning institution, they can provide the feedback as well as rewards, as well as even job control for their staff, as well as the participation from various level to actually chip in their idea in a safer way. And also they can ensure their job security or even supervisor support. And they are actually, all these are recognized as the available resources uh, for, a, uh, for an institution. So uh, let me repeat it again the feedback and the rewards and the job control and the participation, job security, as well as supervisor support, I will say our superior support. It's actually the resources which actually make an educator to be even engaged to their work while reducing the burnout of level. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lok. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lok, for the question. Now, Ms. Christine will share her perspective and ask a question. She's a lecturer and researcher at Atma Jaya Catholic University of Indonesia in Jakarta, Indonesia. Over to you, Ms. Christine. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, thanks, Frederick, for your presentation. Very inspiring, very important. My question to you is I think in yeah. 19 pandemic, what yeah. kind of design? Yes. Right. We must adapt quickly to using the online platform, work from home. Uh, yeah. Lot of courses uh, to work, uh, compare with the office. And this could lead to good satisfaction, stress, and emotional exhaustion. This changes yeah. also higher job demands. Because mm. high in higher education is very demanding now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. out. So please uh, give a condition or an example. How cycle climate can help to make demand is well controlled. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Miss Christine, and also the wonderful questions. So, like uh, what I uh, discussed in the slides, the asset itself actually can be can be perceived as a. I mean, in terms of uh, COR theory, it can perceive as a resource caravan. I would say a resource channel where it can bring in the resources. How we say that? Like through, through the measurements of BSE, we are actually able to detect the risk level, or I would say the risk level in terms of work performance instead of burnout level among the educators. So through the measurements of BSE, if we detect that it is at a high risk, so what should we do is we actually need the focus or the attention of the management then we can bring in what is needed by the educator in order to uh, become, a, how to say, to provide them the sufficient job resources in order to cope with their high job demand. And other than that, in this context of discussion, 
challenge demand itself, which is actually a rewarding experience okay, for the educators. And it is also perceived as one type of job resources. Based on the previous scholar, Verbergen, at year 2009, he once mentioned that uh, if job demand with uh, appropriate job control, it can be turned to something very positive and motivating so that the educators are actually motivated, all right? So they will be very motivated to actually cope with the job demand. So with that, if PSC is able to detect risk and they are able to signal if there is a high risk, then they will actually uh, alert the management to look into the situation and more and appropriate resources will come in for the educator. Then they have more and more resources instead of losing it. They have more and more resources to cope with the job demand. Other than that, if the management of the institution, they can sort the demand into challenge or hindrance demand, then they can lower down the hindrance demand while they are actually alleviating the challenge demand. The challenge demand itself also can serve as another resources. With that, full of resources, I would say rich in resources can help the academician or educators to actually cope with their job demand effectively and easily. And with that, eventually, the urban out level is not increased, but they will be decreased to the minimum level. So all in all, it's about the job resources. And PSC acts as a channel to actually bring in. How it acts as a channel? It acts as an indicator, as a signal, whether uh, the particular institution are in risk or not. I hope I address the question, Ms. Kishri. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe one day later, you can share your uh, PSC mission. No problem. No problem. I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Ms. Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Thank you, Ms. Christine, for that wonderful question. Now we'll listen to a different perspective and question from Dr. Rajesh Nair. Dr. Rajesh Kumar Nair is a professor with experience of 25 years in corporate and academics. He has been a consultant to various MSMEs, consulting them in marketing, sales promotion, and sales training activity. Dr. Rajesh, um, you may want to ask or share some of your experiences of translation from offline to online uh, teaching uh, methodology and pose some questions to Dr. Derek. Over to you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for a wonderful pr presentation by Dr. Derek. And uh, it was very insightful and, you know, especially for a very important aspect about psychosocial aspects. Now, as we all know, because of this pandemic, you know, we all have been forced, you know, to transit from uh, basically offline to online. Uh, basically, it has impacted a lot of us, uh, primarily the teachers and the students. Uh, and I would like to share some perspective about that, you know, how it happened. And then initially, we had to shift, you know, from offline to online teaching. We did not know what to do, how to do about it. So... Primarily, uh, somebody suggested that we should look into Zoom as a you know, platform. And we looked into Zoom as a platform. So, then again, there were some few challenges. And uh, some of the students faced internet connectivity issues, especially in our interior parts of our you know, country. Because we have students coming from all the parts of our country. You know? So... So I would, uh, you know, my, uh, so what I found out that primarily, you know, there was a huge impact on psychological aspects and teachers and students. But I would also like to find out, you know, what are educational institutions basically looking into communicating to the parents of students, you know. This is some area which is not highlighted. Okay, uh, I do not know why. Because uh, maybe, uh, you know, they are not impacted directly, but obviously when they see the awards, been affected in, in change of you know uh, transition this is something i feel you know there has to be a proper communication policy by the educational institutions to the parents of students so that is where so um, so my question to dr derek is basically you know if you could uh, throw some highlights about you know what are the uh, psychological challenges which are faced by you know all the various stakeholders and especially you know in malaysia in terms of teachers students you have shared some of them and even the parents you know of the students correct so yeah yeah thank you okay thank you dr rajis uh yeah thank you for your for your comment as well as uh yeah very insightful questions also 
So uh, the psychological aspect that if we, uh, I mean, because we shift from offline to online, of course they are. So uh, as uh, what Dr. Rajas mentioned just now, uh, yes, educational institution is not really addressed, but obviously it, it really impacts a lot, uh, no, uh, regardless they are small institution or they are big institution. I think the very obvious uh, influence that we can observe is actually that the management itself, they might feel very, very stressed because the student enrollment, they could have declined, all right? Because there are so much concern as well that uh, would they save if they, uh, if they come to co uh, college or university or even back to school to continue learning? Uh, then that's the first thing. And the second thing, how they comply with the standard operation procedure given by the government in order to keep every, well, everyone safe. And as we are aware, if uh, there's one person who is infected by COVID-19, that could be possibly to close down entire institution because they need to trace uh, whoever they come contact with. So this education institution, even they want to reoperate again, then it will be a very stressful situation for them. And if we keep continue online teaching, we, we might lose our students as well because they might not be, they don't find it useful or they, might, they don't find it <coughs> effective enough to actually learn from this way. So they could actually, maybe they will stop or they will think that oh, maybe when the situations become better, then only we come back again. So knowing that we need the students to actually run the entire operations of the colleges or university, even for the high school or primary school. So the number of students is very important for us. And of course, it is a big challenge uh, for the educational institution. And from the perspective of teacher, like what I shared today, they have to adapt with the teaching method. So of course they will feel stressed, they will feel tired, they will feel exhausted. And some they can adapt with fast, or we will say young academician or young teachers. But well, some they are really struggling very hard. I, uh, I once uh, saw a, a teacher uh, using phone to actually capture what the person is teach, uh, whatever he or she likes to share. But end up, uh, when, he, uh, when the person, the teacher finished sharing, then just realize that uh, actually the record button is not being pressed. So that, therefore, whatever that has been taught so far is not even recorded. Then the person is very frustrated and has to reteach it again. And this type of stress is actually only, I think, educator, we can understand it. And one more thing is about the internet connectivity, especially those who actually live in rural area, they might have disturbance all time. They have to find a way. I even read a newspaper saying that people in rural area in Malaysia they have to climb up all the way to the top of the tree, okay, stay there, and actually uh, having the online learning there. It's not easy at all. So for those who uh, stay in city, it's not a problem though, but, but for those who stay in rural area, it's always a challenging. So while they are still uh, anticipating and they are enthusiasm in terms of learning, they still need to sacrifice in that way. Then only they can actually get the same idea or delivery from the lecturers. Meanwhile, for students, they also need to learn, experience, uh, I mean, experience new learning method, and of course, they will experience uh, stress and they feel dissatisfied. I have feedback from students saying that they can't, they can't focus uh, in terms of online teaching because uh, they got, uh, they has actually so much of a uh, distraction, uh, mainly from the family member or main, mainly uh, from the convenience that they have. Uh, they can actually, uh, they don't really sit down properly and listen to the delivery. They could even like laying down and after that, without noticing, noticing it, they already fall asleep. And then sometimes, because with the laptop, they tend to listen to what uh, the lecturer say, but they are actually switching to website, they are switching to games, and sooner or later, they actually disengage uh, from the lesson. And some students do not even have device or internet. So knowing that there are some students, they are not so... Uh, their background are not so capable. They don't even have a laptop or even a good mobile phone. So therefore, they really need to go somewhere else to have the internet accessibility together with the devices in order to enjoy the uh, online learning. So this will be very stressful or bigger challenge for the students as well. And also, uh, parents also cannot skip from the stress. They worry about the development of skills such as you know, the creativity, the exploration, the experimentation that we usually conducted in physical classroom. But with the limitations of online learning, then the parents are worried that the student might not be able to cope very well and maybe they don't really learn effectively. 
And other than that, parents themselves, they have to act as a second teacher in the house. So whether they know it or not, they still need to learn in order to cope the development with, the, uh, with their own kids. So uh, some parents, they literally, they really give up because they might not really know what is going to be shared with the kids. And second thing is, uh, they are not the real teachers. So uh, the children are not really listening properly to the delivery. So they're still hoping that the students can come back to the school so that the teacher can give a proper you know, delivery of teaching. So they are being very stressed about that. They want their kids to come back, but at the same time, they worry. They worry because of the COVID-19, because there is no vaccine at the moment. So once it's infected, the whole family or the whole community is actually affected. So they are in a situation where uh, they don't send back their kids to school, but at the same time, they feel like sending back their kids to school. So they have no option but still stay home at this moment. Yeah, so th there are a lot of psychological stress, but mainly I would say it is the stress level and the burnout level among the educational institution, the teachers, the students, or even the parents. I believe the government as well, because they need to have a proper standard operation procedure. And if anything happens, usually people is the one who make the government. So they have to do their best in order to curb the issues of COVID-19. Yeah, so I believe everyone, everyone in these situations are experiencing high psychological stress. <laughs> I hope I address your question, Dr. Regis. Yeah, thanks for your wonderful insights, Dr. Derek, and thanks for your wonderful moderation, Dr. Uma. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, sorry, well, we have one more uh, Prof Uma, we can't hear you. It's not coming. It's not. Voice is not coming. Yeah, you need to unmute your mic. Will you hear me now? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, yes, yes ma'am. All right. So uh, I was just saying that there is a special thanks coming also from the participants to Dr. Rajesh. For a very different question, uh, including um, even the other important stakeholders in this uh, particular pandemic-connected uh, challenge for an academic uh, sector, which is parents. And uh, I, I think uh, very, very nicely Dr. Derek answered that question. So thanks to Dr. Derek and Dr. Rajesh. Thank you, Professor Now Omar. we will listen to the last panelist, Ms. Gankia, who is Head of Program Come Lecturer from the School of Business and Management, Central College, Penang. Currently, she's pursuing her PhD in Organizational Behavior and Development in University Saints, Malaysia. Her research focuses in psychosocial safety climate and work-related outcomes. With your background on the keynote theme, you may have some specific questions to ask to the keynote speaker. Over to Ms. Gan. Thank you for Miss Gun, right. sorry, we cannot hear you clearly. Oh, okay. So, Dr. Derry, may I know that the elements are the challenge demands and hydrant demands? All right, that's a wonderful question because uh, uh, just now during the discussion, I share the job demand can be separated into challenge demand and also hinder demand. So, of course, we need to know the elements so that we know how to actually shut out the job demand uh, into positive and negative demand. So, based on Kavanaugh at year 2000, further supported by Lee Pine and the colleague at year 2005, it is stated that challenge demand actually can be classified into high job accountability, the element, first element, second one, job complexity, third one is job scope, and the fourth one is workload, and the fifth one is time constraint. These five elements should be applied into the job demand of educator, where the first job accountability, that means their job responsibility, they are, give, they are given the job uh, high job responsibility, at the same time, their job is not as simple, they are a little bit complex and they can think about it, they can put focus on it. And also the job, uh, job scope is well defined as well as the workload is in a understandable, understandable, understandable amount as well as the time constraint is reasonable. With that, it has been proven that challenge demand is able 
to promote the work engagement among the educators. However, based on my research recently, this element could not be turned to challenge demand if we are all, I would say, if the management does not provide a proper job control. Because uh, that is to say, if it is overdose of high job responsibility, over job complexity, over job scope, or over workload, or over time constraint, that means all are in an exceeding level, then that will not be turned to challenge demand, but then it will turn to hindrance demand. Uh, if you would like to understand further, it can be actually explained through the stress curve. Everything just nice when they are, they are in the right quantity. But if they are exceeding the level, it will turn to burn up based on the stress curve. Meanwhile, to answer your question for hindrance demand, the elements are role ambiguity. They don't, do not understand their roles very well. For example, like I, I might confuse that I, might, uh, I have to in charge for this. At the same time, I have to do this work, or at the same time, I need to do that work. So I might not know that whether should I really focus on which part, uh, which part is under my responsibility. So they might not be clear, and that it create a very uh, unpleasant uh, stress level. And also, there could be weak tap, and there can be real conflicts, or there can be even job insecurity. So job insecurity here is means that they don't feel secure with their job now. Means they can be laid off anytime or they don't actually be assured with their current position. And also lastly, one of the hindrance demands, which is very famous in terms of hindrance demand, is organizational politics. So if the management doesn't look into the politics among uh, the educators, I would say, or even the administration part, then there will be a chaos in the organization. And that, of course, will bring down the productivity and work level. So let me uh, wrap it up again. Challenge demand is, High job responsibility, job complexity, job scope, workload, and time constraint in the right quantity, as well as hindrance demand is role ambiguity, with tech and role conflicts, job insecurity, and organizational politics. So based on what I say, if you are able to increase the level of challenge demand, and you can decrease the level of hindrance demand, and I believe the positive work outcome among the educators can be observed very soon. I hope I address your question also, Ms. Gan. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Dari. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Derek. And thank you. thank you, Ms. Gan, for the question. So, uh, that was a very thought provoking discussion from our eminent panelists of different functional areas like organization behavior, marketing, finance, and economics which actually gave us a very well-rounded and balanced perspective of uh, the topic of psychosocial safety, climate and education sector. So thank you, panelists, for your time and being a great catalyst for knowledge sharing to all the participants. Now we'll take questions from the participants. Um, we have 10 minutes. Due to paucity of time, I will pick some select questions to avoid repeat, repeated questions. Uh, you, in case you can read those questions, in case you have a different question, please uh, feel free to chime in the chat box. Meanwhile, I'll read out some questions to Dr. Derek. Um, right. Question from Dr. Dinesh N. How to handle hyper-related stress? How, uh, okay, so to answer the question, how to actually we can uh, handle the hyper-related stress, is it? Am I right? The yes. question? Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, stress itself, we uh, basically we have to understand uh, the situations or what causes us to be stressed. So especially during this COVID-19, I take myself as an example. When I have a multiple roles, especially I have a, a different type of subject in one semester, my stress actually come from the, uh, the effectiveness of my delivery. So like what I'm uh, share with uh, another panelist just now. So if I, uh, I acknowledge that I have a stress in this part, then I will look into it practically, how we are actually dealing with it. For example, I doubt whether I do a deliver uh, effective delivery or not. So instead of uh, putting a doubt, I will just directly uh, get the feedback from the students or even from my superior. How am I doing it so far? Or is there any constructive feedback? We need to, uh, we need to of, of course, we need to be open-minded and we can take in the suggestion and from there we can do some improvement. So the stress that uh, will not bother us for long because we are doing some changes. So uh, with that, the stress can be can be actually managed. And to me, other than that, we also can uh, can 
have personal time with ourselves to understand what is going on or what has been changes inside within ourselves. So if let's say you know that, okay, now I don't feel well or I feel panic or feel anxiety. So what is the reason? What is the possible reason to write it down? So if you yourself couldn't solve it, you can actually find a person that you trust, to talk to, to share with, maybe to get a more rational idea. So from there, you can do some improvement. Then uh, you can have a, maybe from there, you can develop a new skill. So that is to uh, curb your uh, stress level. Yeah, that is my little opinion from that. Thank you, Dr. Derek. The question is from uh, Lavi Sharma. How will COVID-19 change the future of education? Yeah, I think the changes is very obvious that uh, now because uh, across the globe, everybody is actually going through online. And I think within this month, I mean, this few months, no matter which country we are in now, we actually kind of adapt and get used to it for method. So I think in future, we could have a hybrid structure where we have a face-to-face -face classroom uh, teaching. And we also should have uh, online teaching for certain certain reason. And of course, to me, for the lower level of education, face-to-face -face is still very significant because we need to understand the student, we can see the student, we can interact with the student. But however, for the higher learning, I believe that it will, it will have a new direction where it is not fully online, but I believe there are certain courses that they can do distant learning, they can do online learning. And not to deny online learning in certain ways, it is really more effective than the classroom teaching. So I believe that uh, for the benefit of the students or education delivery, we should have a big structure. One from a uh, classroom teaching, if it's the best for the student, and as well as we will mix up with the online teaching so that we can bring the best for the students and uh, for our delivery as well. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Another Thank question you. from Dr. Shruti. How do we handle a work-life balance in the current scenario where work will overshadow the personal time? Uh, at the work-life balance, is it? Yes. Yeah, so thank work you. Work overshadows the personal time of an educator. How do you balance that? What's your uh, suggestion for that? Okay, uh, balancing personal life, to be frank, at this moment, as an educator, especially we need to go online, it's really difficult because uh, we have limited time uh, during our working time and we need to do uh, further or we need to do far beyond uh, uh, what we used to do before the COVID-19. So as what we can say, uh, the more we do, the more we go, I think uh, the more familiar we are, or I would say we're used to it. So from that part, we should start to actually plot out our personal time, and then we should set our priority on what we should do. Then for example, certain people you know how to make yourself relax, make themselves happy in a, in a way that can please themselves. So. Uh, like for me, if uh, in terms of uh, my opinions, so I will leave my work usually in my working time. I'll try my best. Of course, during the steps of COVID-19, uh, I couldn't do that effectively. But sooner or later, when I get used to it, I try to finish whatever I can uh, in, a, I mean, in my university. Then other than that, uh, when I have my own time, I like to enjoy or engage to the activity which make me feel motivated, which make me feel very pleasant. So I will go with that, then I will, I'll be having my work-life balance. And of course, when it is uh, over our capacity or it is beyond uh, our capacity in terms of delivery or any things related to work, it's time actually for us to speak out that uh, what arrangement can be done uh, in order to stay work-life balance. And I believe the management of all education institutions, they are there, they are ready for us to communicate so because they want to bring the best for their institution, same goes to us. We want to bring the best of ourselves. So I think communication is also important when things doesn't go in our own way. So we should actually bring out and speak out and so that they could understand us and we can understand their concerns as well. So that's my opinion. Uh, well, a different question. How does psychosocial yes. distress affect educators productively? Yeah, uh, the stress... This uh, is from HP, the name is not there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the stress, of course, a lot, like what I mentioned earlier. So when we need to adapt with the online platform teaching, and of course, a lot of a requirement from the parents, from the students, of course, we feel very stressed. And of course, our productivity is done. We feel tired, exhausted, long-suffering, like what the definitions of burnout says. 
So at that time, we might not really into what we used to do. We might not really into the detail, or I would say depend into our job demands. So at that time, our productivity is not only affected, but the quality is dropped as well. So I say, uh, to me, uh, self awareness is very important. So when we are actually in a burnout, when you feel stress or you don't feel uh, energetic, you not you are not feeling motivated in your own job. We have to identify what are the causes, and once you identify the causes, we have to identify what are the way to address it. Even if it's a lot, don't worry, do not panic. We go through step by step. What we can do is it we need to speak out, or we need to prioritize our time, or is it we need to manage uh, the schedules that we have? Uh, is it that we need to do it in this way or that way? We set a few alternatives, and we let ourselves to choose whichever should serve the best. Yeah. So, because of positive time, uh, I will ask the last question where I'll combine uh, three different questions. Um, okay. This is a question from Dr. Suvarna, Dr. Achila, and Dr. Mono John. Um, can we hypothesize that management philosophy and policies and support is the only key to achieve uh, PSC? Is one also along with that taking cognizance of self-serving bias and fundamental attribution error. Is it possible to ensure PSC for everyone in the education industry? So, can we, uh, you know, go for a blanket statement? Is the question. And mm. uh, Dr. John's question is: How do we bring a sustainable psychological safety climate uh, for all the stakeholders? So, this will be the last question. Okay. So, for the first question, the blanket assignment uh, assumption: It is not wrong to say that uh, the management actually is the one to make your PSCs to become very successful. However, in by looking into the elements of PRC, it needs the actually the uh, the participations of all levels of uh, I mean from the organization. So it's not only the the responsibility is not solely put into the senior management, but as well as to all the employee, all the stakeholder to sit down together and to look into their expectation. If it will be the best if we can combine our idea, what do you expect and what we can give? we can actually combine together and that will bring the best of BSC. Because if it's about the management itself, it seems to be vertical management, where management will tend to do what they plan to do, but it's not really up to the level or maybe the capability based on the employee. Like today, if I'm the management, I think that you should behave in this way and that way. And this might not be agreed or might not be satisfied among the employee. That's why participation across the level as stated in BSC is uh, actually important. If we can do that communication of all level, then there will be bring, uh, there will be bringing the effectiveness of PSC. All right. So for the second question, uh, Professor Uma, may I uh, may I need you to repeat it again? Sure. Yeah. So the second question is: Can we hypothesize that management philosophy and policy support is the only key to achieve PSC? So, I think that is a yes or no question. Yeah. Uh, that. That's the that is a question that I address uh, as the first question. You address the first question, so it's a part of that that you probably need to move beyond uh, this particular uh, you know set of uh, dimension that we are discussing. So I think uh, this this question is answered automatically in the first question. The last okay. point that we need to conclude with is how do we proactively uh, sustain a psychosocial safety climate digitally mm -hmm. for all the stakeholders? Oh. So how we actually uh, practice, uh, proactively practice it, then in order to benefit the stakeholders. Give some strategies. Give some uh, strategies to sustain a psychosocial safety climate, digitally. Um, digital. Digitally. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so like people are sitting uh, in different places from their homes. They are working. So how do you ensure proactively? So. This question probably is something that has to come from the, the answer should come from the management. How will we, how will they do that? Yeah, Digital. So, yeah. yeah, correct. So uh, like what I uh, discussed with the panelists before this, then the measurements of PIC is very important. So even they work from home, even they work, uh, we are in a different country, the PIC, uh, the shop item is actually applicable effectively to uh, across uh, different places, different country or different industry. So we can actually conduct survey, okay, to the PSC shop item to understand the risk level of the particular organizations. For example, if we let's say now we would like to focus on one institution, even they work from home, 
then we can actually assess by asking the PRC 12 items. So we want to know, even at home, does the management provide the support or does their voice being heard uh, by the management or not? So if the risk level is high, then we need to find an uh, intervention and to evaluate the alternative, what else that we can do. So, but however, uh, I strongly uh, uh, advise that before implementing PSC with the 12 items, even you have the instrument with yourself, you need to receive a proper training in terms of how we implement it, how we interpret it of the measurement of PSC. Because with the proper understanding, okay, with the proper understanding of PSC, you are able to assess the, uh, the educators, even they work from home, you are able to understand and to assess, and even you can come up with a proper effective mechanism in order to deal with yes. the stress level among the educators. So for me, most important thing is you understand the measurements of PSC and how to run the PSC, how to interpret the PSC. It can be applicable to all types of industry. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Thank and you. that was indeed a wonderful uh, set of questions thrown by the participants. And thank you, participants, for that uh, interactive, uh, highly interactive uh, participation. Yeah. So, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the conclusion of today's webinar. It was a very insightful and thought-provoking webinar. When institutions are closed due to lockdown, educators are working overtime, which takes a toll on the mental health of the educators and administrative staff. Dr. Derek spoke in a very succinct manner about the types of job demands on employee due to the pandemic-related new normal and how hindrance job demands overpower the challenging de challenge demands. Dr. Derek concluded by mentioning the strategies to counter the issues that develop out of poor psychosocial climate like increasing the challenge demands and reducing the hindrance demands and burnout. The experts panel took the discussion to the next level by asking probing questions and sharing their insights from their vast academic industry and research experience. I will conclude on an optimistic note by borrowing a quote from one of the participants uh, from the chat, uh, Ms. Margaret LG. Uh, she says, when going gets tough, the tough gets going. So uh, we can always look at an optimistic future where we are all challenged by this uh, unprecedented uh, um, pandemic uh, created new normal. Maybe we will sail through this too. So. Uh, that's from me. So may I request all the participants to enable the video feature to take a group photograph, please. Please enable your video feature to take a group photograph, all the participants. AIBPM coordinator may please tell us when you are ready and we will pause and uh, we'll proceed. Okay, we'll we conclude. are taking it now. Okay, one more. Can we have one more, please? Okay. Okay, we have taken the photograph. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Derek. You. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Derek. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Yeah. And uh, thanks, Dr. Thank Uma. Thank you very much. It was, you know, Dr. Rajesh. Yeah. Thank you, Uma, ma'am, for wonderful photo. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Thank you, Derek. So, uh, uh, I will thank, you. thank you, Professor Uma, for the moderation. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Derek. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Come to an end. It was very exciting and interesting talk. Thank you, ABPM, for having me, and thanks to all the panelists and participants who followed for the the end. I would love to see you again for the next webinar, which is uh, 2020 IBPM talk on July 20th. Keynote speakers, 
Dr. Garima Mathur from Prestige Institute of Management, Gwalior, Dr. DC from University of Science, Malaysia, and Dr. Ng Selim from Arab Academy of Science. Uh, the topic is human resource, organizational behavior, leadership, and work-life balance. I, Professor Uma Warrior, sign off. And thank you all for your kind attention and have a great day ahead. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much.